this morning. We hope that this can be a place where you can connect, grow, and serve. Connect with God and the City family through worship and fellowship. Grow in your understanding of God and who you are. And serve the community of Northwest Arkansas. Today is Sunday and it's time for church. Let's get started. Amen. Let's sing good worship this morning. Let's go ahead and stand up on our feet. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? My God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Sing so, open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? And our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fire.
King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. If you would, can you hear me okay? If you would, for just a moment, if you could turn around and shake somebody's hand, hug a neck, kiss somebody if you feel so inclined, spread the flu, whatever you decide. Y'all can be seated for just a moment this morning. I want to take just a moment. We're opening up our service today, and I just want to share a couple of things that are on my heart today. I know it's dangerous. Remember, they allow me to have a microphone. You might be here all morning. Uh, But I just wanted to share something with you. Has anybody been under the weather here recently? other than me. I think about everybody in this room. Last week, Pastor Casey preached a great message. And every week that you come here, somebody has prepared hours upon hours upon hours to preach the Word of God. Daniel spends hours upon hours preparing every one of these songs. You'd think that there was a band of 50 people up here, and he writes every one of those things out for us. A lot of preparation goes into this. And I, I don't say that to pat anybody on the back. You always have to be careful when people pat you on the back, make sure it's not where they're trying to find a place to put a knife. Um, but I'm not patting everybody on the back for their own benefit. I'm saying that because things have been bathed in prayer. Things have been prepared to share with you what God wants you to hear today. And so when I sat there and listened to that message about how Uh, they're crying out for God to restore unto them the joy of his salvation and and about how sin can lead us into captivity but repentance can bring us back home I started thinking about all the things that that meant to me to hear those words and it kind of reminded me of whenever I'm sick I'm reaching out for something that's good for the soul a little bit of medicine something I need to hear and when we're sick that's all we want right You don't go to the doctor to hear his great advice. You are there because you want him to write out a prescription. You want the medicine, what's going to make you feel better. I mean, your doctor may be nice and all, you're not there for him. You want the medicine. And you got to go see him first. And I see that as us reaching for something that will make us feel better, something that will change us to make us better, to get rid of the things in us that we don't need. And I thought about that when I was sick this past week. The man flu is so real. It is, it is a thing. And, and as I laid there on death's doorstep with the flu, all I wanted was Tamiflu, right? <laughs> if you could just get you some Tamiflu, keep drinking liquids and banana popsicles, that's my, that's my go-to to make me feel better. Banana popsicles. If I could just get some banana popsicles... Afraid you could just go to the store and get me some banana popsicles, I'd feel better. And that's all I needed. I, I, I just I needed those those medications in me because I would do anything to feel better. Then I started thinking about humanity. The things that you're going to hear today and preach into your life, and these songs of worship that you hear are like that Tamiflu. <laughs> you just need you need that time of healing and restoration and those things of the soul. For those things to penetrate your heart and to steep into your mind so that God can minister to you. I don't know what what sickness is of the heart and of the mind that you brought in here today, but there's healing here this morning. There's going to be a time of refreshing. There's going to be time for all that medicine to sit in today. And I hope that when you walk out of here, you're a completely different person. Amen. And I say that because I know that the men of God who are preaching the word of God here this morning, and I know that the worship has been anointed, and God wants to do something in your heart and in your mind today. Amen. So if you would stand with me, we're going to prepare our hearts. This next song, let it be medicine to your soul. Let the words that Pastor Chris preaches be medicine to your soul. We're going to have a time of communion and a time of prayer if you choose to do so. Let God speak to your heart today. And let it be soothing to your soul. Father, we just thank you for this time that we have here this morning. And I thank you for your presence that's here in this place. 
Lord, let these next moments that we have together be a time of refreshing and a time of renewal. And I pray, Lord, that we would be attentive to the words that are preached today. Let the words that are sang in these songs of worship to you penetrate our hearts and our minds. And Lord, let your Holy Spirit do his work in our life this morning. And we'll give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And all God's people said. Treasure. 
stripes we are healed Lord you said by your stripes we are healed in our body and our sins are washed away by your blood Lord. 
Jesus. This morning, if you have any needs, if you need any prayer, I just want to invite you up right now. We have Pastor KC on this wall, to my left and to your right, Pastor Chris. We also have communion available. If there's anything you need prayer for, you want prayer for, or anything you want agreement with, I just want to invite you up right now. This morning we're going to sing a new song. About the overwhelming reckless love of God. I just want to invite you to just stay in this moment in this attitude of worship and prayer as we sing this. shadow you won't light up 
mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after no shadow now there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me no 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 there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me sing it up again now there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me no wall you won't kick down, why you won't tear down, coming after hope and know the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night. You give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God a movie uh, a few weeks ago. We don't get to go to many movies, but uh, we've, we uh, celebrated Christmas a little early so we could uh, have a, our own Christmas here in Northwest Arkansas before we went back to, with family in Tulsa. But uh, So we went and saw that movie, The Star. I don't know if I've shared this or not, but uh, it's about the nativity story. And uh, it's one, Have you ever had one of those emotional moments in a movie that you didn't see coming? I was like, whoa, that came out of nowhere and it kind of caught me off guard. Does anyone can relate to that? It was like, that got me and I wasn't expecting this kid cartoon to get me, but it got me. Well, there's a scene in the movie, and I hope I don't run anything for you, but there's a scene in the movie and then, uh, it's the Christmas story and there's these villains that uh, they kind of got things out of order in order to make the story work, but the, uh, they have, there's these villains that are supposed to come and kill uh, Mary and uh, the baby when they, when they find Jesus. So, uh, the whole movie, they're searching for him, and they're, and they're trying to find him. And there's uh, this big, evil-looking guy, looks like a Roman soldier. And he has these two mean dogs, and the, the, the animals are the ones that talk in the movie. And so uh, they get to this point in where this, uh, uh, these dogs fall off a cliff, and the main character is this donkey. Kind of a cute movie, you should see it. Around Christmas time, it's not appropriate now, but... Uh, so this, this donkey saves him and he's holding him and he's got this decision to make and if you've ever seen like action movies like I'm more of an action movie type, type guy to where you want justice instant justice, it's like just kill the guy and get it over with So you're in, the, the man side in me is like well just let the, the dogs go and we have a happy ending here the bad guys die, the good guys win we have this beautiful manger scene it's going to be a great ending to the movie but he saves them and I had this split second where I was like, well, that's stupid. Those are the bad guys. They're supposed to lose. But now you're going to save the bad guys? And then it like, hit me like heavy, like a, hit me real heavy right here. And I was like, whoa, 
getting a little emotional. This is kind of surprising me. But I realized that was me. Those dogs were me. And it's a cute kids movie, but, but it, it, it made it real to me for a second. I don't deserve anything. Those dogs didn't deserve to live. I don't deserve to stand up here and preach the word of God. I, believe me, I am not worthy to do that. Only through Jesus Christ I am. And I don't, I don't deserve that at all. And so for you, if you feel like you've come, if you've come to church and, and you feel like, I don't really, just, I shouldn't be here with these people. I shouldn't, I don't belong here. I feel uncomfortable. If, I, I just feel unworthy to be in a setting like this. Well, know that I feel exactly the same way this morning. We sing, we sing lyrics, and I, I pull them up because I'm really bad about lyrics. Ask my wife, she makes fun of me all the time about it. But it says, uh, it says, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, and leaves the 99. The Lord is like that. He'll fight for you. He'll put people in your life. He'll, put, he'll bring you to places like this where you can hear his word, and he'll fight for you. And it says, I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it, but still you give yourself away. I, that resonates with me. And I don't know if it did, it did for you when you were singing those words and maybe you were thinking about something else and, and you're like, oh, I didn't, even, I didn't even notice that we were singing that. Well, think about it because we're going to sing it again, if that's all right. Because I, I, I don't feel like we're quite done yet with this song because at least I'm not. And I'm in charge today, so, so I get to sing it again. <laughs> But it said, I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, but still you gave yourself away. The overwhelming, never-ending, that you can't get away from his love. You can't get away from his grace. He has so much to give that we don't even understand it. The reckless love of God. In our world, it's reckless because we don't understand it. If, if you were to give yourself away to, to another person like that and give, them, and give that much grace, it doesn't make sense. We're like, you should leave him. If he's abusing you, if he's doing this and this and this, this, you should leave him. It's reckless. But when it comes to the Father, we're real quick to accept it because we are the ones that are the offender. And we accept that grace. That should, that should humble us a little bit. That should set us back just a little bit. So if you've seen this song again, think about it. But I don't want you to sing it from a, from a place of guilt. Sing from a place of freedom because it's been given to you. If you believe in him, if you commit to live, to live, your life for him it's free and it's given to you we sing that, that chorus again sing. oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God oh it chases me down fights till I've found leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it don't deserve it still you give yourself away know the overwhelming river ending reckless love sing it again oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God oh it chases me Fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Know the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Can't go on anymore in this service without asking this. If there's anyone today that needs to accept him, would you please let me know that right now just by slipping your hand up? I've got to come pray with you. I've got to spend this time with you because if you haven't if you haven't realized this grace in your life before, don't leave, don't move, don't live another moment, don't live another second in your life without accepting that grace, that freedom that he offers. Right now is your time. Just slip your hand up and wave it around. Let me see it because now is the time. This is not planned. This is not something we prepared. This is something that's important. All right. Well, then we can move on with service. Let's move on. You may be seated. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for, uh, thank you for leading us this morning. Whew, I really don't want to transition like that, but uh, we have to. We've got to move on.
a good song. Well, uh, hopefully you've been blessed this morning already and that uh, you feel refreshed already this morning. Uh, that, uh, we have more for you. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on this scripture, mostly because I didn't understand it all the way. I had trouble with this one. I spent a long time on it. Uh, before we get into that, I do need to take up the offering. Uh, Casey and, and Dennis uh, passed that around. We appreciate your, your generosity. Uh, man, it's a, it's, it's a spiritual action. It's an act of worship that uh, is extremely important. Um, and so I thank you for, for exercising that act of worship in, in our services today. And soon, uh, along those lines, there's diff- different ways to give. You can give uh, in these different ways. But there's a new way coming. I've ordered a, I've ordered a new way. And uh, we're just going to have a box in the back that you can either put money in when you leave or when you come. And we'll, we'll just mention that and not pass the buckets around and make it weird for you. feel like if it's weird for you not to put money in at the time. <laughs> we don't want like a guilt-driven uh, offering. We just want you to, to live that out. Uh, as you need to. So, uh, yeah, the offering. And uh, a couple announcements. There's a lot going on this month, actually. Tonight starts, uh, we're going to take this sermon, this, this message that we're going to be preaching in just a second, and it's going to live on with us in, uh, in, uh, in our connect groups tonight, our city groups tonight. And so uh, it's going to be at Libby's tonight. Uh, so it's 6 o'clock. So come talk to me, Libby, any of the staff, and we will get you directions on how uh, to get there and, and what to bring and all that stuff. We have a good time. We share a meal. We talk about the sermon. We usually talk about other things that aren't relevant to anything at all, and uh, we kind of get on tangents. But uh, the main thing is we have a, re- a really good time, and the sermon lives on throughout the week because we talk about it and kind of apply it to our lives. Uh, also, something important is our Wednesday night prayer, city prayer nights. Um, <clears throat> this is something that that we don't take lightly. That's something that we put uh, a lot of value in. In fact, we, we say this is the most important night of the week. And so uh, we, if you would, join us uh, this Wednesday night. And plus, look forward to plans in the future. Uh, <clears throat> Daniel and, and myself are working on uh, a once-a-month worship night uh, to kind of give this a little energy because we believe in this. This is something that's important to us. We believe that all the, any success at all that we've had is because of the, these prayer nights and because of us praying for the future of the church and for each other in, the, in these uh, prayer meetings. Also, uh, if you are new to the church at all, uh, if you've been here uh, for less than a year, we want you to sign up for our Connect class. It's going to meet January 21st here in this room. It's at 6 p.m. It's, gonna, uh, it's the same time as our, our city group, uh, but there will be two groups that night meeting. And so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll meet in here. Uh, we'll provide dinner. We'll make it easy for you. We'll provide dinner. And we're just going to talk about the church, what it means to attend the church, what it means uh, uh, to be a, p- a part of its, uh, of its fellowship, also what we believe. And so it's, it should be fun, lighthearted, and, and a good way to get to know uh, each other. So that's coming up. And then uh, I w- also we have men's night coming up January 28th, and we're going to go see a movie, uh, 12 Strong, I think is the name of the movie. So uh, anyway, make plans. Uh, for January 28th. Done with the announcements. All right. So we've been going through the series, and it's a long series. We're just kind of stuck in it because it's, we want to make sure we get every little piece of it. <clears throat> and I've enjoyed it so far. I'm, hopefully you have, and hopefully you're not getting tired of us uh, preaching from the Psalms. But uh, it's called Songs for the Road. We call it that because uh, it's about the uh, Israelites as they made their trip to Jerusalem three times a year for these festivals. They would sing these songs and they, they would or recite them or however they, they did it. But they, uh, they would sing these songs as they went up uh, to, the, to the city of Jerusalem. And uh, they were meaningful to them. As we have Christmas songs and holiday songs like, like that, they mean a lot to us. These were kind of like that. You know, we don't have Thanksgiving songs. At least we don't. Maybe you do. Or, or Halloween songs. That would be really weird if you did. But uh, maybe there is Halloween songs. I don't know. But we, don't ha- we only have Christmas songs, typically, and so, uh, but they had different songs for different things, and, and these w- is what we're going through. So uh, today is uh, Psalm 127, and I'm going to pick up there. I'm gonna read, let's read it first. It said, unless the, ha- the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it, 
uh, with centuries will, will do no good. It is unless you, unless for you to work, I'm sorry, it's useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to those uh, he loves. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are re- a reward from him. Uh, children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. Like I said, these were songs they would sing as they traveled. And for us, it's like, well, that's not a very good song. <laughs> of course, this has been changed with translations and it loses a lot of its uh, artistry throughout a lot of this and stuff. So this isn't a song that I would necessarily sing, uh, but they did. And, and this is uh, one that they found was, was important enough to include in these Psalms of Ascent. And so we kind of look at why this was important to them. And well, it, a lot of it is because Solomon was a part of it. They, this, the credit is given to Solomon for writing this. I don't know if he wrote it or if he inspired it with his teaching. I'll let, leave that up to you to decide. I I couldn't come to a 100% conclusion on that. But from, mo- from what I've seen mostly is that he wrote this, and it's, it's, it makes sense because his life is a, he didn't live like this. This isn't his life example. These are the things he learned from his failures in his life. He is the ultimate example of living a life in vain. And so that's kind of what he's talking about here at first. Um, so the song has to be about how work, accomplishments, buildings, food, safety, relationships are all worthless without God's involvement in them. And how the things of God are greater than the things that we put value in. Um, we put value in funny things. Like, if you ever get mad at your spouse for really dumb things and later you're like, why, did, why was that even an issue? We do this because we put value in stupid things. And... And a lot of times it's just out of necessity. It's just out of uh, living in the moment. And we think whatever I'm doing in this moment is the most important thing ever. And we put value in stupid things. And so, uh, yeah, this is a, a psalm about putting value in the correct things, putting value in the things of God. Because we're very poor evaluators of, of what is important. We seek to accomplish uh, we seek accomplishments and possessions, but God wants us to seek, seek relationships. He wants us to invest in people. So let's, let's look at like a family, let's look at a house, a home, and let's uh, see how you properly uh, manage that. It gives us some good advice for home management here. He wants, us, he wants to help us first build the house, protect the house, provide for the house, and bless the house. So let's look at this first one here. It says, uh, bless the house. So we have our first scripture, throw it up there. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builder is wasted, okay? Whenever I first got married, we got a couple here getting married soon. This is how it goes, okay? You may relate to this, but when you pick out your first house, uh, whether it be an apartment, uh, a duplex, a rental, or a, a home, to purchase, if you're like me, you didn't really care. It's like, hey, I need somewhere cheap to live. We don't have money. Let's just find a cheap place. And really, I don't care. As long as I got a place for me and my wife, then I'm good to go. So our first house was much different than the last house we purchased. Now, I, I pulled some pictures. This is our first house. So we have the essentials here. We had this little duplex. I think it was like three or 400 bucks a month, really cheap. And honestly, the only thing I needed was her. That's all I cared about. I didn't care. I thought, hey, this is cool. We got our own place. And we had no furniture. This is a picture of me modeling our new sofa. As you can tell, I definitely looked like a model. So uh, we were really excited about that sofa. In fact, if you have been to our house for City Groups, we still have that. It's been a very good piece of furniture for us the last 11 and a half years. So... When we first started, though, we had no furniture. We had folding lawn chairs, and then we bought another one. This was actually our second sofa. The first one didn't last as long, obviously. Um, but the only thing that mattered was that I had her. Now, I sound like I'm romantic or whatever, but if, if you've 
been a newlywed, that's, that's how it is. It's all I need is my wife, and it's going to be great. But it's funny, the further you go, the more like, you've got to have some other stuff, okay? We were super excited about the sofa, as you can tell. We were, I'm just really excited there. And I was wearing cargo pants. Pretty sure that's the only time I ever wore those pants, but there they are, immortalized forever in that picture. So when my first house, all we needed was love. The last house I bought needed to have enough rooms. We needed more rooms. We were, our family was growing. First house, it must be cheap. The, second, or the last house I bought it must have a playroom. <laughs> playroom wasn't part of the, the deal when we were looking for this. It was like, does it have water and a place to keep my food? And it had both of those things, so we were happy. Uh, first home, no need for stuff. The last home must be able to hold all of our stuff. I don't know if, about you, but if you're like me, and you've moved a few times, every time you move, you have to get a bigger truck to rent, right? I remember we moved into this house. We had a Toyota Tacoma. That's a little one, right? Yeah. We had a Toyota Tacoma with a trailer on it and my, Grand, my Pontiac Grand Prix. And we moved everything in that. No problem. I think I, I had room to spare. When we moved to our next house, we had to take two trips. We had moved across town, so we had to take two trailer trips. And we had, because we had sofas and stuff like that, you know, we were, we were rolling. But it's funny, because we moved into this bigger house as a church parsonage, so we had a little more room. And we filled it up. We're like, we got all this room, let's fill it up. So we were like getting stuff, hand-me-downs. My parents been wanting to get rid of forever. We were getting... We were just getting stuff. And uh, when we moved from, from that house to Tulsa, we had to have a 26-foot moving truck, the biggest one U-Haul makes, you know, and then pickup trucks and cars. My parents' cars were loaded. And then when we moved back to Arkansas, it took us like six months, which going back and forth, <laughs> to get all the stuff. If we ever have to move again, I think I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and get the big, the big semi-truck to get everything in because it's just crazy how much stuff you have. So in the beginning, all I needed was Kara, and, and I, that's really, really seriously all I cared about. But it's funny how we get so distracted by material things. We lose focus on, on the uh, only thing that truly matters uh, to build a home, and that is relationships and love. For us, we kind of got reset a little bit when we were in the hospital with Paige this last summer. Uh, when you see your, your daughter hooked up to like a million hoses and... and all the things that keep poking her and, and sticking her and uh, the passy lady keeps coming in to make sure her pacifier is still there and uh, all those things are happening. You, you change, you get perspective, okay? So, so for us, this was what, what mattered in the, in the beginning, but, but after that, we just go to the next picture and nothing changed. We had our new house, we had all those things that we, we thought we needed, but really, it stayed the same. Family was what we really, what we really needed. And the, the time in the NICU helped kind of reset us on that path. This is probably why Kara was okay with me picking out our house sight unseen. I mean, I picked that out without her even ever seeing it. Can you believe that? Husbands, would you ever do that? Yeah. I wouldn't either if it, if it was up to me. But, but Kara couldn't get out of the hospital, and we had to do that. And so I was just really nervous when she walked in the house for the first time. I was like... Is it all right? <laughs> I mean, you can take pictures with your cell phone, but uh, that only does so much. So she liked it. It needed some work, and, and it still needs some work, but, but it's, it's been a good home for us. So unless the Lord and his values build the house, we lose focus on what truly makes a home, and in result, our efforts are wasted. You know, I've, last night I was up late, and we got a new rug, and I was trying to, if you were trying to put a rug under the bed, that is not easy to do because your bed is huge and the rug is huge and there's, there's a lot of things, moving pieces there. And so, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, I've been walking with a limp this morning. I have no idea what's wrong with my foot. Something's really wrong with my foot. And so I'm up there like trying to limp around and trying to help and it was probably the worst possible thing I could have done. But we're, we're making it happen and, uh, and it's funny the things we do for our home, but, but really the most important thing is that you're there with your family, and you put the, the, your value in the correct things. All right, next one, protect the house. 
It says, unless the Lord protects a city guarding it, those centuries will do no good. Okay? Um, this was a big deal for Israel. They had guards that would patrol the cities at night. They had a lot of enemies. Uh, if you've ever read the Bible, you would realize that Israel has a lot of enemies. And they still do today. Nothing's really changed. They have enemies, so they needed guards. They would patrol and they would watch for surprise attacks and, and uh, look out for those things. And so this was something that was real to them. And, and when, you, when you read this, um, well, okay, look at their history, okay? What happens when Israel isn't following God's commands? They don't do so well, right? It's, Jerusalem is, is, is under attack. They're being... Uh, uh, under siege, they're in the wilderness wandering around, they're not safe. They lose their safety. But when they are faithful to God, and when they finally realize that, hey, I need to, we need to follow God again, oh yeah, <laughs> that seems to work. Things work. They're safe. They're, they're, they're living a much better lifestyle. So they realize this. Solomon realizes this here. He says, unless the Lord protects the city, you can guard it all you want, but it's not going to matter because God isn't protecting you. You lose the protection of God. Remove God, you remove safety. Something everyone values in a home is safety. Your home should be a safe place for your family. When we lived in that little duplex, we had a rough night one night. We had a, I, we were at, it was Wednesday night, we were doing services, and our church was kind of far away from where we lived. Um, maybe 20 minute, 25 minute drive. And Kara went on ahead of me, she wanted to go home. And when she pulled in the driveway, or this little, is a duplex, and there's four duplexes facing each other, and uh, there was these girls that followed her, and there's a bunch of, bunch of girls, and they were really mad about something. I don't know why they were so mad about, but they were like uh, asking who she was, what her name was, and, and they thought she was lying, and they tried to get into the house. So she ran into the house and locked the door and called me, and I remember when I got home, uh, I got home and, and she was under the bed, terrified. If you've ever come home to your wife like that, you realize, I need to change something here. And so that night we slept and uh, a little uneasy. And I remember thinking, okay, if someone comes in, all I have to protect my house is this nine iron golf club, which if you see me golf, you know I'd be pretty deadly with it. So. Aside from my skills there, uh, lack of, I guess, um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, I just didn't have a lot of peace about that. So I bought my first shotgun, okay? I bought a 12-gauge, so I could just sp spray, <laughs> destroy everything, take the bad guys out. But for whatever reason, that, that, that helped me have a little peace at night, knowing I had a loaded shotgun next to my bed before we had kids. Now, I don't do that anymore. So we do things to try to protect ourselves. And you should. You should protect your house. That's your job. You've got to protect your house. This few, fast forwarding a few years later, uh, we lived in, in this house in Tulsa. And I, I've shared stories about it before. And I think you've even told this story before. But um, we lived next to a bar, like a biker bar. I, I didn't realize what it was when we bought it. But the more I learned about it, it was not a good good place. Uh, uh, the banditos hung out there a lot. I don't know if that means anything to you, but uh, so there was a lot of action going on. And I remember there, was, there would be these shootings and, and different things going on. But one night, I don't know if you remember this, it was maybe 2011, somewhere around there, that we had a pretty big snowstorm. It's, it's one of those where the drift got up about this high. Uh, so pretty big, big snowstorm. We wouldn't know anything about that anymore though, right? We don't get snow anymore. But okay, here's the picture here. So I woke up, and this guy is standing on my porch. It was, it was the only, one of the only times I remember that we lived there. It got below zero. So it was like negative four, and I get this knock at 2 a.m. on my door. This guy's beating on my door. And I opened I don't know any of this is going on outside yet. And uh, so I grabbed my gun, of course. So I had 45 in the waistband. Made me feel a little better about the situation. But of course, I didn't open the door. Don't open the door at 2 a.m. I'm like, what do you want? And he says, I'm freezing to death. Can you please let me in? I was like, no. <laughs> you, can, you can freeze to death uh, before I let you in my house. But uh, 
man, I don't sound very compassionate right now, but that's the right move. Don't let people in your house that, uh, if you live next to a bar like that. Or really at any time. But I look out the window, and this truck is fully engulfed in flames. I mean, it is just... If you can imagine the biggest fire you've seen, that's happening in my front yard. And uh, so I call the fire department and I, I go outside and take him some coats and blankets and stuff and take care of him. So I had compassion for him. Don't look at me like that. Uh, but it was a very weird situation. It kind of made us reevaluate. Like, do we want to move? Is this, this is kind of a weird thing. The guy had obviously had too much to drink and he got in this ditch, obviously in his work truck, and he was kind of freaking out that he was going to get in trouble. So he thought, I'm just going to floor it until I get out. So he just burned his motor up and caught on fire, and I guess tires caught on fire. It was just a ridiculous situation. Poor judgment on his, on his behalf. But nights like this kind of make you, make you wonder about your safety sometimes. And there was other nights where there was bullets and stuff. I remember we were working on the, uh, I was working on my roof one day, and there was like bullet, a, a bullet in my shingle because these, Sometimes they would go outside and they would just start shooting in the air. What, I don't know what that's about, but they decided they were going to shoot in the air. And, and so there was just some stupid things going on. So we had moments of fear in that house, but the bar was not our only enemy. And I say all this to say you can put security systems in, you can put cameras up, you can have guns, and you can have strategic plans and safe rooms and all this stuff. But sometimes the enemy doesn't look like that. See, to this day, we face many enemies, not just thieves. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but, but I came to give you life abundantly. You see, your home needs to be protected from more than just stealing and killing types. People will come and try to steal and kill. Protect yourself from that. But don't forget the destroy part. Nothing will destroy a home faster than sin. Statistics will show you that, that homes are torn apart more commonly by infidelity, greed, selfishness, then fire, flood, another disaster. Okay? Sin can rip a home apart. And that can, that can be the enemy that we're talking about here. It doesn't always have to be the bad guys, the robbers. Okay? Your, your BB guns with the compass in the stock and the whole uh, the scene. I, I just have that scene in my head about, from the Christmas story uh, about this. But... So yeah, so how do you protect your home? You do this by letting the Lord protect it and by trusting in His Word. Follow His commands, just like Israel. You follow Him, safety will follow. Doesn't mean bad things are not going to happen. Doesn't mean, uh, you know, things may, may come and life won't be perfect. But it means that your house will be safe, protected, and that there will be peace. And, and you will be protected from all kinds of enemies, not just the type that you feel like you can arm yourself against. Next thing it says, it says, provide for the house. Verse 2, it's useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, uh, for God gives rest to those he loves. Sound familiar? Working night, day, day and night, doing extra jobs on the side. Uh, Cassie jokes with me, and I, she said this to me the other day, that I need a trench coat so I can wear and I can just open up my trench coat and sell like watches and stuff from it because I peddle so many small electronics and, and things out of my, my house from the way I, I earn money. And so I understand the, the side gig and, and the working extra hours. I, I get that. And that's something that is, is okay to do. It's, it's not saying we shouldn't work. But churches have made the mistake along the way to, of... Uh, getting lazy and, and blaming the laziness on faithfulness. See, the church in, in Thessalonica got lazy by saying God is going to do everything that needs to be done. Paul had to intervene and let them know that they had to work and not freeload off people that are less, are less faithful. Okay? Your work ethic, if you have a good work ethic, that does not make you less faithful. Okay? Let's just clear that up. In fact, that is a good thing. You should have good work ethic. In the same way, though, you can work extremely hard and miss the point. I mean, look at the, the Tower of Babel. They tried to build this huge tower, and it's a great, great plan. It's an incredible building. But they did it in vain because God wasn't a part of it. And so we can do the same thing. We can work our tail off, work in extra hours, do all the side stuff, and it can consume your life. 
But if it's all in vain because you take God out of it, if it doesn't further your faith, then, then it's all useless. Ecclesiastes talks a lot about this. It's, I like reading Ecclesiastes. It's, it kind of sets things into perspective for you. So the key to providing for your house is to not work in vain. Work, but not in vain. Last year, we had a, a city family Christmas, and man, we worked our tail off. We just worked so hard, and uh, we had practices and rehearsals. And, and uh, if you remember, not in 2017, but in 2016, we had a small little uh, snowstorm that, that swept through, uh, small, and it was very little snow. It was dusting. But it caused little, little slick spots on the streets and stuff. And so the night before, we were debating on whether to cancel service. And, and I, had, I had somebody telling me, you've got to cancel service. You've got to cancel service. We can't, we can't do this. People are going to die. This is going to be this way and this way. And I was like, we have worked so hard on this. And I don't want all of our work to be in vain and cancel service because of a, a little dusting on the ground. The, street, the, the city's going to do their part. They're going to get the, the streets treated overnight, and in the morning it's going to be fine. And it was. It was fine. We had a great service. There was 60, 65 people here that morning. Uh, it was one of our, of our larger attended services of the year. And it was a great day. But the problem that I had, it was I didn't want to do all of that work in vain. It would have been in vain because, it, because we wouldn't be using it for the Lord. It would be just doing the work for nothing. Incredibly discouraging, but th- th- it happens, okay? Work isn't wasted until it wasn't able to be used for the Lord. And if we're not careful, we can do this in our homes. We can work, work, work our tails off, but miss, the, miss out on the ways God is blessing our homes. We can't see it because we're busy working for something else. You ever heard of David Livingston? Famous pioneer missionary. He has this quote, and uh, I found this really cool picture of him that I thought I'd put on here, but uh, but he says, I hope you are playing with your children. And looking back, I have one regret. And that is that I did not feel it was in my duty to play with my children as much as to teach them, uh, teach the natives. I worked very hard at that, and I, and I was tired at night. Now, I have none to play with. So my good friend, play while you may. They will soon no longer be yours. Good advice. And isn't it encouraging to know that even back, back then, they were dealing with the same thing. There was people working so hard that they, that they had the same struggles. We, we kind of blame it on our electronics. We get busy with because we're so connected and we can do so many things while we're at home. Well, the same thing was happening, and it has happened for years. And that's, what, that's what, a lot of what this scripture is about, is putting in value in, in, in important things. The Lord wants you to spend time with your children. He wants you to value that time because he gives you these children as a blessing. Excelling at your work is not a bad thing. In fact, that is one of the ways that God blesses you. Uh, but it is in, he, does, he does this. He blesses you at, by letting you excel at your work so that you may, in return, bless your family and build your home, not your house. See, he, he won't bless a career just to further your career. He his plans are big picture, and his big picture is for your home. Solomon, the author of this psalm, found himself in a place where he got caught up in trying to provide for his home, but ended up providing for his house. There's a difference between a house and a home. If you're working to provide for your house, you're trying to build your house, make it nice, make it comfortable and, and fun, or whatever you need to make it. But if you're worried about your home, it's a different situation. It's keeping things in the correct perspective. See, Solomon just discovered more wives won't solve the problem. And I can guarantee you this, 100%, more wives in your household will not solve your problem. Take that one to the bank. I don't think we have that problem here this morning, though. More money won't solve the problem. A little more relevant to us, probably, this morning. More money won't solve the problem. More wisdom can't resolve the problem. It's the value behind those things. And the only thing that can take care of that is valuing the things that God values. So build up and keep, and build up and keep what you produce. But you need to recognize that God is the only one who ultimately keeps you safe and secure and that, uh, that, that there is a need for rest. To rest in Him is a sign of faith in Him. 
That means you trust him with your life, your family, and your future. The last thing we're talking about this morning is bless the home or bless the house. It says children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. How joyful is a man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when, when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. All right, I'm going to be completely transparent uh, with you this morning. When I read this initially, I didn't understand the connection here. It was like he was telling us one thing, and then it was a sharp transition, and then he's talking about children as a blessing. Then once I got to studying more, and I understood it through the eyes of Solomon and the Israelites that were singing this song, you realize that they are singing about putting value in the things that God values, like we've been talking about this morning. Solomon failed when he valued material things over God things. Israel also failed when they focused on the things that God doesn't bless. God loves people. We should love people. Our work should be for the people we love. Our possessions and accolades should be for them as well. So this helps you build the home, protect the home, provide for the home, and then he blesses you by filling the home with people that you love. See, work can provide God's blessing for the home But it goes beyond work. It's important to work. We must work. And Daniel, if you want to come up, we're going to close here pretty soon. But what God does with children is different. It doesn't require work to obtain children. And I'll be careful with that statement. (laughs) It's a thin line. See, you have to work to help, help God build, protect, and provide for your family. But the blessing part comes from love. Children are a blessing from God. No amount of work can earn a child. They are given by the Father. They're gifts. I can't work extra hours and I can't sell extra things out of my trench coat and try to to make ends meet in order order to buy a child or to to earn a child with my good merit. I can't go, I'm not going to sin for a whole month, Lord, if you'll just bless me with a child. I can't earn it. It's not part of the deal. God chooses to bless your home with children. And I'll take that further. Maybe it's just the people that you fill your home with. It's another way that God shows us that we can't work or earn a blessed home. What we can do is value the things that God values. We can put hope in that. And then we can wait and sit back and watch God bless our home. He can fill it with children, fill it with, with, with people that you love, the, truly the things that matter, people, relationships. That's what builds a home. See, possessions are not the prize. People and relationships are. And as we close this morning, let's pray that we start to live for the things that God values and put things that we, val- that we value in the background. If you want to truly be blessed, we must live for the things that God lives for and value the things that he values. This morning as we think about this, as we go into prayer, what is distracting you and steering you away from your family? What are you putting way too much value in that has nothing to do with the things of God? Maybe it's not bad stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm saying things that we value are bad. I'm just saying maybe they shouldn't have that much value in your life. Maybe you got to keep things in perspective. What's creeping into your life that might destroy your home? We can have guns and security systems and everything, have plans, safe rooms, all this plan. But that doesn't stop sin from creeping into your home to destroy it. What blessing are you missing out on because you are chasing something less of less in eternal value? Just think about these things as we, as we take just a few minutes. We're closing. We're, we're about done here. But I want us to take a few minutes and just think about these things. Think about what you value and make sure that it's the same things that God values. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your time. For this time that we just spend with you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would value the things that you do. And I pray, Lord, that when we start to put 
our, our work, our time, our efforts, our money into the things that you value, that you would bless our home. You would fill it with love. You would fill it with healthy, strong relationships. We want to seek the things that you see, Lord. We want to do the things that you want us to do, Lord. Help us with that, Lord. Amen. I hope you leave today realizing that you can't earn anything. You can't earn the right for your children to love you. You can't earn the, uh, the, your salvation or, your, or this blessed home. All you have to do is just put the value, your value in the right things. Everything else can work itself out if you just do this. I, I share a great example. Uh, one of my favorite examples of, of, of a healthy marriage is a triangle. And uh, this is something that uh, really is is a big deal to me and Kara. Uh, I promise we're not like Illuminati or anything, triangles in our house, but, but I built her this thing uh, uh, f- for Christmas. It's a triangle, and, uh, and we're going to hang it in our bedroom, but uh, it, it's a symbol of our marriage, and, and what, what it is is you have this triangle, right? You have th- three sides, and, and at each side, there's the husband and the wife, and at the top, of course, is God, and as you both push forward to God, the closer you draw to Him, the closer you guys grow together. And I I truly believe this, 
that, that if you want a healthy marriage, if you want a healthy family, and this works with any relationship, is both people are pushing in the same direction, you're both pushing together and you're growing closer together. The, the worst thing you can do for a marriage is have one side drop off because both sides end up dropping off. I, I believe this. I believe if both, if both sides work together, you will have a solid marriage. This works with all relationships. So push closer to God. Value the correct things in your life and it's all going to work out just fine. I believe this 100%. Take it to the bank. I apply it to my life. I, I trust in that. It's good advice for this morning. Let's close and uh, let's get out of here. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. I pray that we should leave today. We would value you. We would put you at the top of this triangle. We would push and try our best to get to the top with you, Lord. We love you. And we thank you for this time. In your name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you so much for being here this morning. We, we, we really value you. We're glad you're here.